Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with a delightful top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic, 10 tips on exhorting others. Some of us are non-confrontational and don't want to say anything when we see a problem. Others quite enjoy dishing it out, although they may not take it as well as they give it. But the answer to Cain's question, am I my brother's keeper, is a definite yes. We need to learn when to speak, how to speak, and what to speak if we're going to be a real help to God's people. What is the best way to admonish? Showing folks what's wrong so that they want to make it right? All right, so let's look at our 10 things to try to sort this out. Number one, start with a positive investment in people. I think that's true. We've all heard the line, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if, for example, an older woman wants to invest in a young mother, it's probably not the best way to approach her to say, by the way, I've noticed your kids really misbehave badly in between the meetings of the church. Start with something positive. There may be a time to talk about that and say, you know, we found in our family that if you get the children to sit quietly during family devotions, then they transfer that ability into the meetings of the church. There's a place for that, but the scripture says it's harder to win your brother than to take a city. And so we have to think about our strategy as to how we're going to win people over and we should begin with the positive and build a bit of a relationship before we begin to zone in on some issues. Number two, before we think about what to say, we must consider how to say it. Galatians 6.1 says, You who are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of gentleness or meekness. That's strength and control. So we need to have this understanding that when a dentist puts in the needle, if he's in a hurry, it really hurts. If he takes his time and he's patient, it makes a big difference. And so it is in dealing with people. This problem didn't start yesterday. It won't be fixed tomorrow. We need to be patient with the process and gentle with the other person. Number three, don't even think of correcting someone in an area where you haven't submitted. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. That's the rest of that verse in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. We're dealing with live grenades here. Some of these problems can blow people apart, blow marriages apart, blow churches apart. And we need to be very careful when we're dealing with many of these issues. And so it's important for us that we have a solid ground for dealing with these subjects which means that we've been through circumstances where we've had to learn this lesson and we're sharing with them. So I think even in a, the layout, if instead of us sitting across from one another, if we sit beside each other, there's something mentally that changes. So that instead of we're aiming at each other, we're sitting together and we're looking at the problem. And if we have that both physically and then mentally, have that idea, we're in this thing together, rather than I'm sitting in the high seat, speaking down to you, and I'm going to show you how to fix this. Number four, be prayerful before meeting, at the start of the visit and in conclusion. James 3.17 says that we need the wisdom that's from above. Before I even talk to my wife, though we've been married almost 50 years, I have to pause and say, Lord, I don't want to say anything that you wouldn't say. Because men do not tend to have a good relational skill set. And so we may say things that we think will fix the problem and they actually make things worse. So we need the wisdom that's from above that's first pure and peaceable and easy to be entreated. That kind of wisdom is way better than my own human sense 
because sometimes I think I'm helping and actually I'm making matters worse. Number five, remember the objective is to build up and not to tear down. I love the words of 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you are also doing. So the idea is the word comfort, parakaleo, means called alongside to help. And again, this idea of sitting together as opposed to the idea that we're in some kind of combative situation. And the word to edify obviously means to build up. And so sometimes we don't quite understand this word parakaleo. Sometimes exhort seems a bit strong. Sometimes comfort seems a bit soft. But if we put it in equal amounts into the mixture, we end up somewhere in the idea of encourage. So to comfort actually is confortis, to add strength, like encourage, to add courage. And that's what we're trying to do with folks. They probably know what their problem is. The Spirit of God's already shown them. They may not know the way forward, or they may just be looking for courage and someone to hook their arm with them and say, let's go together, whatever the case. We want a positive outcome in the end. We're not trying to put people down. We're trying to lift people up. Then number six, try at the outset to get the party or parties to agree on one thing. Are you wondering what that one thing is, Dave? <laughs> I think the one thing that we should agree on is that we don't have a private agenda. We just want what God wants. If in a marriage situation, both the husband and wife can honestly look each other in the eye and say, I don't want my way. I don't want your way either. <laughs> I want God's way. And if they both want God's way, it's solvable. The problem is when we inject our own personal agendas, that's where we get off the rails. So if from the very beginning we can come to that and say, you know what, I don't want my rights because my right, if I got what I rightfully deserved, I'd be in hell right now. I don't want that. I want God's way. And if we can agree to that, half the problem is solved before we even get started. Number seven, be a good listener before you give suggestions. Wow, Proverbs 18, 13, it's foolish and shameful to give an answer before you listen. People who launch into something, oh, I know how to fix this, I know the, the answer to this problem, very often the people you're talking to don't even know what the problem is. They're focusing on symptoms. And they don't even know what the root problem is. So we're going to have to have the Lord give us discernment to even diagnose the problem. And when you sit down with a doctor and you say, doctor, I've got this pain, he's going to start asking you diagnostic questions and he's going to listen to your answers. When did this start happening? Does the pain radiate or is it localized? There are lots of questions he's going to ask so that he can determine what the prognosis is. If you just assume, oh, I, I know how to handle this, you don't even know what the problem is. The Bible says that is foolish to do that. It's shameful to do that. Number eight, <clears throat> there is never just one side to a story, rarely just two. <laughs> you remember the story of Ziba and uh, Mephibosheth. So when David had to leave the city, uh, when Absalom rebelled, Mephibosheth was getting ready to go, but then Ziba took off without him. Remember, Mephibosheth was lame. Ziba took off without him. Mephibosheth had already provided some goods to help David with the journey, and Ziba took credit for that. And that's all David knew. When David comes back and there's Ziba, he thinks, okay, Ziba, you know what I think? Because Mephibosheth has not appreciated my grace towards him, I think you ought to get Saul's inheritance instead of, instead of uh, Mephibosheth. When Mephibosheth finally meets David, he hasn't cut his hair, he hasn't trimmed his fingernails, and David says, like, well, what, what's with you, Mephibosheth? And Mephibosheth said, well, I couldn't travel on my own. I needed Ziba's help, and he left without me. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, maybe that's true, or maybe it isn't true. But look, says Mephibosheth, here's the evidence. It's just like time has stopped for me. 
until you came back. And David said, well, you can cut the inheritance in half. You can each have half. And Mephibosheth has the right answer when he says, David, look, let him have it all. I don't care. As long as you're back on the throne, that's what makes me happy. And David could determine what the real story was. We need a lot of wisdom in these things because, um, you know, self-portraits are usually colored. And I look at things a certain way and I think this is how it is. And I may not be lying. It may be that that's just my perception. And so very often there are sometimes two sides, sometimes more than two sides. Sometimes the truth is somewhere else. And we need huge discernment. But when we start playing favorites, if we're trying to deal with a couple and we start playing favorites with one side or the other, it's the sure way to jettison the whole project. Number nine, be biblical, even if you have to get back to the parties on it. Sometimes we feel that we have to be the fount of knowledge. And, and so I have to know the answer right away on everything. And sometimes I don't know the answer. And sometimes I have to say, I need to pray on this and we'll meet again tomorrow evening or soon and, and we'll discover what the Lord has said about this. Because to give the wrong answer in a situation like that, when I'm being looked on as God's agent speaking for God, I better get it right. And I need the Lord's help in this. So sometimes I have to get back to people on something. The, the scripture says, whatever things were written before were written for our learning. That we through the patience and comfort, again this idea of exhortation of the scriptures might have hope. Now there are good books. Some of them are not good books. They use Bible verses at the start of the chapter to sanctify a lot of pagan thinking and try to turn it into Christian psychology where it's not very helpful. There is some who do base it on the Word of God, the principles of God's Word, and they can be helpful. But there's nothing like the Word of God because it's alive and it's able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. So this is a huge asset. Even if I don't know the problem and they don't know the problem, if I read the scripture to them, somehow the Spirit of God uses that passage to bring conviction to them because it's alive in itself. And then finally, number 10, this is learning the gentle art of foot washing. In John 13, we have this beautiful portrait of the Lord Jesus getting down and washing the disciples' feet. And when he gets up from doing that, he says, if I, your Lord and Master, have done this, you ought to do it to one another. Now, obviously, he's not talking about physical feet washing. He's talking about something spiritual because he says, what I do, you don't know right now, but you will know afterwards. And the phrase, if they have washed the saints' feet, is used elsewhere, not to describe physical feet washing, but the careful, gentle, application of the water of the word to the walk of God's people in such a way that they are practically refreshed and cleansed in the process. So as we look at this process we notice number one the first thing is we need to get down to wash feet. We need a spirit of humility. We're not talking down to people we get down and we're able to minister to them as servants and not as bosses. Secondly, the water mustn't be too hot or too cold. After all, they may come to wash my feet tomorrow. But let's not get too hot or too cold. Let's make sure that it has that uh, refreshing element to it when we wash their feet. Uh, then thirdly, um, you have to get your own hands in the water. In other words, you need to know the Word. You need to personally apply the Word of God to your own self if you're going to hope to apply it to someone else. Number four, if it's done right, they're both refreshed and cleansed. Now, we noticed earlier in, in a study of the rules of, of Bible study that the first mention of foot washing is not cleansing but refreshing. And that should be our first objective, to refresh. And the idea when you refresh your computer screen, it's getting a fresh start. And so we should be thinking in those terms, this is an opportunity for these people to get a fresh start. Finally, it's no surprise that if in this process of getting down, 
gently washing their feet. We're not using a, a metal scrub brush here. This is a gentle ministry. And if we're doing this and they are refreshed and cleansed, then uh, we'll remind them of Jesus because that's the kind of thing he does. God help us. This is a very needed ministry today. We get so busy in our own lives, so distracted, we hardly notice the people around us. I think of the sad story of a medical doctor who was trying to staunch the flow of suicides from the Golden Gate Bridge. And he tells about going to the apartment of a young man who had just jumped and killed himself. And they found a little note in his sparsely furnished room. It simply said, I'm going to walk to the bridge. If someone smiles at me, I won't jump. And evidently they didn't. People are hurting all around us. If we ask them, how are you doing? They give us the politically correct answer, uh, fine. But the fact is that a lot of people are not fine. And if we care enough to ask further, then God can use us in helping them get refreshed, in having a fresh start at life, recouping their hope, getting uh, corrections in their lives that will bring them forward in the Christian experience. And through this, we will encourage them. We will fortify them, we'll strengthen them in the life of faith.